Okay, our, uh, our scripture reading uh, today, the passage is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 14 and 18 to 20. Um, you can either follow along on the screen or turn there in your Bibles. So verse 12, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is God's word. That excerpt is from one of the most prominent passages in uh, the Bible on uh, what the resurrection means, written by the Apostle Paul to a bunch of Christ followers in the first century who lived in Corinth, a seaport town. You know, as I think about it, few things are as powerful and impacting as is a personal testimony. A person who has seen something and giving witness to the fact that they have seen this or that. And they're telling you how it has affected them, how it has impacted them. Well, I thought since a personal testimony is so powerful, why not begin this message with a personal testimony? But now here's the catch. It's not my story. It's not my personal testimony. What I want you to do is try to use your imaginations this morning and imagine that it's not me that you're seeing here, or it's not my voice that you're hearing here, but you're actually looking at and listening to the voice of an eyewitness to the events that took place on what we call Good Friday and the day after, and then Resurrection Sunday morning. So without further ado, I give you a personal testimony that's not mine. The burial had been so hurried, we were not even allowed to finish the preparation of his body, so rushed were they to get it into the tomb. It was a loner tomb, mind you, offered up by a rich Sanhedrin member from Arimathea. But I had wanted to finish the burial ritual, and so I decided that early in the morning, before anybody else was up, I would personally take spices and go back to the tomb. But when I arrived, I was surprised to see that the massive stone with which the tomb had been sealed had already been moved. What in the world could that mean? I asked myself. I was thoroughly confused. I was disturbed and frightened. I ran to tell Simon Peter and the others about what I'd found. And immediately they did exactly what I thought they'd do. They grabbed their cloaks and they ran with me back to the tomb to check it out. Of course, John, the one still in the flower of his youth, reached the tomb first. And since it was standing wide open, he looked right in and he saw a strange thing. The linen burial wrappings were lying there, but there was no sign of a body anywhere. Who in the world, let me ask you, when stealing a body would have taken the time to unwrap it first before they moved it? Frankly, I think that would have been as repulsive as it was impractical, and it made no sense. Well, John didn't bother to go in, but when Peter arrived, typical for Peter, he barged right in. He observed the same thing that John had seen, linens just lying there, but he also noticed something else. He noticed that the cloth that had been placed on Jesus' head when he was entombed had been, as it were, deliberately folded, it, folded up and placed in a spot all by itself. How odd. All of us were bewildered. Had somebody taken the body? If somebody had taken it, who? And if they had taken it, why? What was the purpose in taking the body? And if they had taken it, for who knows what reason, where had they put it? 
So with countless unanswered questions and having no idea what we were supposed to do next, the disciples went back into hiding, which they had been doing, but not me. I couldn't leave the garden. I just couldn't. Let me explain something to you. My heart was breaking. You see, Jesus had healed me. My life before Jesus, you would not have wanted to have known me. Before Jesus, my life was tragic. And then he came. And now here I was, not even able to do that last most basic thing for him, showing the respect of a decent and proper burial. And I wept. And I wept, and honestly, I cried ugly. I sobbed. Eventually, I stooped over to take another look inside that open tomb, and what I saw, I got to tell you, I was not prepared for. Was it real? Was I seeing things? Because inside that tomb sat two figures. They were dazzling. They were almost blinding. I was stunned. What Are these angels, I asked myself? One of them sat at the place where Jesus' head had lain, and the other one sat where his feet had been. And then one of them actually spoke to me. Woman, why are you weeping? He said, and I thought to myself, why am, why am I weeping? You don't know? And I blurted out, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Then, you know that sense when you feel like somebody has walked up behind you? Somebody's standing there? I had that sense, and I turned my head, and there I saw what I presumed to be a gardener, and he asked me the same question. Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? <laughs> Sir, I said through my tears, if you've carried him away, just tell me where you put him, and I'll take him. And then he spoke again. Mary. I lost my breath. Rabunai. I said, that's all I could say. My teacher. There before my eyes stood Jesus, fully alive, completely whole, flushed with life. But how? I had watched him die horrifically. And here he was calling my Name, me, Mary of Magdala, a nobody, a woman with a sordid history, just one of thousands of people that Jesus had healed. Impulsively, I rushed at him. I just wanted to hold him and never let him go again. But he smiled at me, and with a loving laugh, he said, don't hold on to me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. And then he gave me a job to do. He told me, go and take a message to his friends, the other disciples. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, he said. Tell them, I'm ascending to my father and to your father. I'm ascending to my God and your God. So I did what he asked. I went running. Was it flying? I don't know if my feet touched the ground. Arriving breathlessly with the news that Jesus is risen. Now, here you and I sit 2,000 years later and we ponder these things. Do you ever wish that you had been there? How many of you have wanted to have been one of those witnesses? Would you have wanted to live through Friday, I ask you, and Saturday in order to experience Sunday? When I think about the experience of Mary Magdalene and the other disciples on resurrection morning, it makes me think of what it feels like when the sun comes up after a very long, dark, hard night. And I've had a few of those, and I think some of you probably have too. At daybreak, after such a night, one of the first things that I tend to think, one of the first things I think that many people tend to think is this. At last, the long, dark night is over. You know... I have backpacked with a guy a couple of times who uh, really gets creeped out at night. 
He's a grown man. He's older than I am. Can, and, and, and it's weird because when you're on the Appalachian Trail, there's no electricity out there if you're in a tent or if you're staying in a shelter along the Appalachian Trail. And when you hike in the fall, it's dark at 5, 530. And it's not light again until 6, 630 in the morning. And this guy, his head, it messes with him. And he can hardly, endure. it's almost like a claustrophobia to think that I have got to lay here in the dark for 12 hours or more. And it really does a number on him. I think a lot of people can relate with the dark hours, the nighttime. The night can be filled with troubling, fearful, distressing thoughts. But guys, isn't it amazing the change that occurs once the dawn has broken and the light begins to spread across the sky and it comes in through your window and it starts to enlighten your world? Doesn't it bring a difference? It does for me. The troubles of the dark hours seem a little bit less oppressive when the daylight arrives. Now, at Easter, I often think of Mary Magdalene. I often think of Peter and John and Bartholomew and, and all the other disciples, his friends on earth. And I think of them in the aftermath of that terrible Friday when their world absolutely crashed. And I don't think you, can, uh, you and I can possibly understand what that must have felt like. See, in the blink of an eye, the person that had become everything to them was snatched away. And not just sort of in a passive kind of way, in a brutal, horrific execution. So I can't begin to imagine what his friends experienced during that couple of days. I think they had to feel like their lives were now pretty much over. Remember, they had left everything. Do you know what it means? And I think it's an appropriate expression for Easter when you say we put all of our eggs in one basket. It's appropriate on Easter, isn't it? Okay. Well, the disciples, the followers, his friends had put all of their eggs in the Jesus basket. They had invested everything in Jesus' stock. And guess what? It just plummeted. Big time. And I have to believe that these must have been the darkest, most hopeless hours of their entire lives. I think they felt lost. I think they felt stupid. I think they felt afraid. I know they were absolutely confused. I don't think it would be too much of a stretch to say that they were in shock. What would have gone through your mind had you been one of them? Do you think you might ask yourself, was I a fool? Was I snookered? What am I supposed to do now? Where am I supposed to go from here? Am I supposed to just go back and try to relive the life I used to live before Jesus? Now, if you can, turn the page. Sunday morning, the morning of Jesus' resurrection. Can you then imagine what it must have meant to those traumatized, emotionally distraught followers of Jesus to encounter him again personally and to see him alive, resurrected from the dead? And to use the metaphor that we're kind of working with here, it must have felt somewhat like the arrival of the dawn following the longest, most terrible night of their lives. So maybe you've experienced some nights that felt like that. Fear and loneliness and confusion. I think pretty much everybody is familiar with them. And frankly, they're just a part of life. But, and here's what I want you to see. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead speaks into these experiences. And it promises something to us. It promises his living presence with us in the midst of those times. Because he is not dead. He is alive, and you will never be alone. He is alive, and he is with you. Now, there is an amazing narrative recorded in the Old Testament prophet Daniel about three young Hebrew men who were living in a land far from home and a culture far from comfortable for them. They were living in Babylon as exiles. Their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
And the king of Babylon at the time had issued an edict sort of to unify all of these, um, these people groups that had been collected as slave nations, servant nations for him to bring them all under his authority and to unify them, to make them all behave in one accord, he issued an edict that you will all bow down before the image that I erect. And should you decline, you'll be tossed into an incinerator. We called it fiery furnace. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had absolutely no recourse but to follow their conscience. And so they refused because they knew that this wasn't a god. And for a Hebrew young man, there's but one God to be bowed before, and it was Yahweh. And so they refused. Edict carried out, tossed in an incinerator, heated hotter than normal, shall we say. And the king observes the process, and he watches that they are not immediately overtaken by the heat and the flames. And you can see them walking around in there, and he counts not one, not two, not three, but four figures, when all he did is, didn't we have three Figures thrown in there? I, why do I see four people walking around in there? What are they doing walking around? And then he says, and the fourth has the appearance of a son of God. Just when Jesus' friends felt most alone and most abandoned in their own fiery furnace, they learned that Jesus is not dead. He is alive and he was present with them just he was, as he was with those three Hebrew young men in their fiery furnace. And he is with us in the midst of our fiery furnace. So the resurrection of Jesus from the dead means, first of all, that this long, dark night of fear is over. Now, there's a second thing that I think I can say with regard to the breaking of the dawn. Says, when the dawn arrives, the day of new things has dawned. The day of new things has arrived. All right, guys, don't things just look different in daylight than they do in the dark? I remember when I was young, maybe late elementary school, maybe even as late as junior high, I remember I couldn't go to sleep if my closet door was partway open. Anybody relate to that? I, could, I would lay there all night imagining that there were these grotesque faces and hands and feet reaching out from the partially open door. Maybe that's why I still have to make sure all the doors are closed and the, and the drawers are pushed all the way shut. Just ask my wife. I don't know. But when the daylight comes, where does all that go? Stuff looks different in the daylight. Your circumstances at night... Sometimes I just feel completely overtaken, overwhelmed by the circumstances of life at night. And I lay there and it troubles me. I understand, cast all your burdens on the Lord for he cares for you. I understand that. That's easier said than done. But when the daylight comes, do not those difficulties look slightly less troubling? Things look different in the daylight. Now, listen. Listen. Jesus' friends' encounter with him alive again after his resurrection meant that everything was now new. The world as they had known it had changed, and I'm not overstating this. Things would never be the same for them. The old rules no longer applied, see, because it used to be that when people died, that was that. That was it. It's over. That's final. People don't come back once they've died. They don't raise themselves back to life. But now, if with Jesus, death is no longer final, how does that change the way we embrace the living of our lives? Now, remember that since the arrest of Jesus on Thursday night, these disciples had been in hiding behind locked doors for fear of the authorities. And do you blame them? I certainly do not blame them. They were without a leader. They were without hope. They were without direction. But now, following the resurrection, they are transformed into bold, 
confident powerhouses who are filled with the very power of God himself. See, things that they had not understood before now are beginning to come clear. Things that Jesus had said to them before, which made no sense, now made sense. You see that expressed several times as you read through the Gospels. Jesus' friends now had a new vision of who they were. They now had a new purpose for their lives. They now had a new task that was laid out in front of them. Instead of returning to what they had been, whether it be fishermen or unpopular and hated governmental employees or whether it be political activists, you sort it all out. No, that is not what they are going to be anymore. Now, they are going to be ambassadors, boldly spreading a message of forgiveness of sins made possible because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, that is a change. Sometimes I read through the book of Acts. The book of Acts thrills me. And I have to say that as I read through Acts, it is amazing to me to see how central the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was to these people, the Acts of the Apostles. How central was the message of the resurrection of Jesus to these apostles? Let's put it this way. In short, it was the message of the Apostles. You take away the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and they had no message. What did they preach? They preached Jesus resurrected from the dead. It is that message that was constantly getting, in, getting them into trouble. It is that message that cost all but one of them their lives. But would they give up talking about it? No, of course not. Why? They could not help but speak of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead because it had changed everything for them. Now, here's a question. If there had been no resurrection of Jesus from the dead, what could possibly explain the change in these people? It's hard to imagine it otherwise. I think their lives would have continued like they had been, probably somewhat in a downward trend. But the day of new things had dawned, guys, because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And I thought of two Pauline passages that make this applicable for me today and for you today. Romans 6, verse 4b. Note the emphasis on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Just as Christ was raised up from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And he wrote to the Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, crucified, buried, and risen again, He's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So guys, not only can we say that because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, number one, the long dark night is over, and number two, the day of new things has dawned, but there's a third thing we can say. We can say that the way ahead, which used to be filled with foreboding, is now bathed in light as you look down the road of life ahead of you. Perhaps the most obvious effect of daybreak is the fact that you can now see. The world is illuminated again. You can see where you're going. You no longer have to grope blindly, stumbling along in the dark. And despite all of our modern lighting technologies, nothing can rival the sun and the rising of the sun and the energy that it brings to your world. Now listen, when Jesus' traumatized followers saw him alive again, after knowing that he had been absolutely, certifiably stone-cold dead, suddenly the distant future down the road for them was awash with light. It was as though the dark and fearful corners of the future where the specter of death had always lurked were now ablaze with brilliant sunlight. Imagine how the words that they'd heard Jesus speak personally at the graveside of their friend Lazarus must have taken on new depth to them when they saw him alive. Remembering the words of Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live though he dies. 
Do you think that had a little bit more meaning, a little bit more depth now? You see, death is that thing which most people fear more than anything else. Many people, frankly, are terrified to die. I don't know if any of you are in the room. Few of us are actually comfortable with the idea of dying. But that's not new. 65 BC, a Roman poet, a Roman poet named Horace wrote, Pale death with an impartial foot knocks at the hovels of the poor and the palaces of kings. Do you get the impression that Horace thinks that a welcome visit from pale death? No. It was a foreboding thought. But now here's the deal. Because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the most fearful part of life, death, has now been exposed as ultimately impotent. Because of Jesus' power over it. What had until then lain shrouded in mystery and shadows has now been laid bare to the light because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. On the basis of Jesus' resurrection, we have the same hope. And I want you to make it personal. Again, I want you to read about how the Apostle Paul spoke of the hope that is yours because Jesus has risen from the dead. Here's the way he described it to Christ's followers living in Thessalonica. He said, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. And what is that a euphemism for? Die. And particularly who? These are Christ followers who die. I don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus, what? Died and what? There it is again. Died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Those who have died as followers of Christ. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will, what? Will rise. When? First. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord how long? Forever, therefore, what are we supposed to do with these words? Encourage each other with these words. Now, my friends, as we tie a ribbon on this, that is exactly, precisely what I want us to be doing. We are seeking to encourage one another with these words. Now, let me summarize. What have we said? We have said, based upon the testimony of Mary Magdalene and the experience of the other disciples, we have said that because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, number one, the long, dark night of fear is over. We have said that because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the day of new things has dawned. Things will never be the same. And we have said that because Jesus has risen from the dead, the pathway ahead is awash with light. It is no longer dark and mysterious and foreboding. All of this is so because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Please allow me to say a prayer for you. Great God, the Lord of life, just as surely as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead over 2,000 years ago, he remains risen today, so we have no cause for fear. We rest our confidence in him, and as he calls our name like he called Mary's that morning, we too hear him. It is Christ who was risen, as Charles Wesley put it, with healing in his wings. It is Christ who banishes the darkness 
and pours light and hope into our lives. It is Christ who calls each one of us to trust Him, to follow Him, to serve Him. And so then, we, the people of the resurrection, rejoice today. For Christ is risen. And all God's people said, Amen.